Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Got a great episode today focusing on a theme I've been incredibly interested in this year, deglobalization and why the story of the economy over the past 40 years isn't quite what we think. We've had our episodes with James Rickards last week on supply chains, the big one with Peter Zion back in June. So it's good to dive a little deeper onto the deglobalization topic. I'm speaking with Shannon K. O'Neill. She's the author of The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter, and how we can think of regionalization as the most important economic trend over the next decade. Hope you all enjoy this episode and continue to get something from this daily series. Shannon O'Neill, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. I'm going to do my favorite thing and ask the first question based on the book title, but I swear we will get somewhat deeper beyond the obvious. What is the globalization myth? So the title of the book, The Globalization Myth, is uh, my argument uh, and supposition that globalization is not as widespread and profound as we usually think. You know, we hear a lot about globalization. And it seems to be this inevitable juggernaut that's transformed countries and economies and moved jobs to other places. But when I've looked back at the economic data over these last 40 so years, we see only about two dozen countries that have actually transformed their economies by opening up, by globalizing. Um, and so the way I measure this is looking at trade as a percentage of GDP. Only two dozen countries have doubled their trade. Conversely, there are dozens of more countries, you know, 89 countries, actually, in fact, that have seen trade as part of their economies stay the same or even decline since 1980. So they've deglobalized over this last 40 years of global supply chains and, and internationalization. So we see a very different overall scenario than I think we often believe or sort of is the conventional wisdom. So that's one side. Not that many of these countries participated. The other side is that when trade happened, and indeed it did. If you look at trade in 1980, it was $2 trillion. You look at it today, it's $22 trillion. So yes, there's a lot of trade. There's been a big growth. But when you look at where companies go either to buy things or to sell things, more often than not, they don't go to the other side of the world. They don't globalize. They tend to go next door. They tend to go within their region. And you know, one data point that really brings this home to me is that the average good that's traded goes 3,000 miles. That's how far it usually travels. That is the distance from New York to Los Angeles. That doesn't get you to Shenzhen or Shanghai or Berlin or Brussels or lots of other places around the world. So I think that gets a sense of how close by actually this trade is. It isn't as, as global as we think. So not as many countries are participating. And when they do, they're not going to their side of the world. They're not as global as you know we often think. So that's the myth that I'm trying to dispel. So many follow-ups there. So number one, I'm sure you're noticing a lot of this discourse around after COVID, globalization is quote unquote over, we're entering this new era. Am I correct then in taking from what you're describing here that maybe globalization as was defined by 2000s to mid 2010s discord, it never actually existed. Nothing is actually over because it wasn't actually there in the first place. Yeah, so that would be my argument. Say, oh, we're going to deglobalize and we're going to regionalize. And I would answer, we're already regional. That's already happened, that the internationalization of these last 40, 50 years, which really has happened in terms of money and goods and increasingly services and people and ideas, there has been an internationalization, but it never went as far as we think. And, you know, the real reason for this, which I think also tells us something about what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years, is that companies just didn't find it as profitable as you think to go to the other side of the world. And sure, we have examples of high profile companies like Boeing that sources from 58 different countries. So sure, there are global companies out there. I'm not saying that there aren't, but there are thousands or tens of thousands of other companies that didn't go so far. And in fact, McKinsey did a survey of companies and they even came up with a term. They call it the globalization penalty. And so if you went abroad, you could increase your profit margins. You'd make more money and be more efficient and effective. But go too far and your profit margins start to fall again. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for this. They sort of expect, you know, it has something to do with, you know, trust and the ability to communicate across long distances. It has to do with different legal systems. It might have to do with, you know, free trade agreements and, and sort of the ease and ability of doing business across borders and the like. But whatever all these reasons combined, 
it already gets expensive. There's frictions put in there, even with, you know, low cost transportation, even with, you know, wireless communication or communication that doesn't cost anything anymore. Even with those, it was hard to go to the other side of the world. And what I would say in this, you know, after COVID and with geopolitics, and we can talk about all the factors that are now shaking up supply chains around the world, even with that, this regionalization that already was underway, I think we're going to see more of it for exactly that reason. Okay. So the other question is when you were describing all the countries that actually had a sort of regression or a stagnation in their overall trade since the 80s, what was going on there? Because I've never heard it framed that way before. That seems really counterintuitive because you think, oh, we're in this massive race to the bottom with factory labor and wages and opportunity and all the outsourcing. If you're any country except, let's say, like North Korea or like Western Sahara, it seems like there was a massive opportunity for you. So why didn't globalization reach those countries outside of the very specific Cold War geopolitical things, also including Cuba, obviously? Sure. Well, one of the tenets, I think, of this last 40, 50 years of internationalization is the regional ties. And so what we've seen over these last, you know, several decades is the rise of three big regions, three big manufacturing hubs. So one is Europe, one is Asia, and one is North America. And most of the other countries, those in Latin America, in Africa, in South Asia, in the Middle East, many have been sort of pushed to the edges of supply chains. So they have raw commodities that they send out to sort of these three big manufacturing hubs, and then they often receive back the finished goods, right? The the computers or the blenders or the cars or the processed food or, you know, you name the very products that we're buying. But they lost a lot of that middle ground where they might make the pieces or the parts that go into that process. And in that, I would say they lost some of the ability to diversify their economy, to gain some technological knowledge, some managerial expertise, the other kinds of things that would allow these countries to grow faster, to become more sophisticated in terms of their economies. So so what's happened to those, you know, 89 other countries that didn't participate as much? I think they got left on the sidelines here. So if we talk about winners and losers from globalization, and, you know, we do talk a lot about that. And, you know, often we talk about in the United States, you know, particular communities that were affected where, you know, an industry left or a fa- factory plant shut down. I would say there's countries that have been affected pretty significantly here, and most of them are in areas that didn't become part of these regions. So let's actually go through the three big regions. You're describing strengths, weaknesses, what happened, what you see as the moving forward. So let's just start with Europe, obviously. Like, what is Europe? How does you? Is this like the United? Is this the European Union? Like, what are like what is the nature of the manufacturing hub there? So the way Europe became a a region was very top down and through lots of treaties. Um, So if you look back at European history since, you know, since World War II, you know, almost every big city and capital has a treaty. There's the Treaty of Rome. There's the Treaty of Nice. There's a Treaty of Lisbon, Treaty of Maastricht. There's all kinds of treaties. And so diplomats got together and they started setting the economic and financial rules here. And so they stripped out tariffs. They stripped out regulations. They created one currency. They created one passport. They set other kinds of rules that would allow trade and economic opportunity and finance and the like to work together across a growing number of countries as new countries also joined the European Union. And through that, uh, and also through creating institutions, they created a court, they created a legislature, they created a commission that's sort of like an executive body. Um, they have an investment bank, they have you know antitrust, they have all kinds of different bodies. These have really knit these economies together and allowed them to be competitive together. Um, and so that, I think, is really Europe's strength. And they are now the one of the biggest manufacturing exporters in the world, precisely because they brought together now 27 countries uh, to do this together. And and one thing I would say, just back to your point about, you know, isn't globalization a race to a bottom? Isn't that the challenge? And, and one thing we've seen that Europe has shown us is that by coming together, these countries have found ways to produce globally competitive goods without going to the race to the bottom, to have higher wages, to have labor protections, to protect the environment, to do these kinds of things, but still be competitive with world markets and with world consumers. I'd love to hear where you think uh, the United Kingdom fits into all of this, because the UK obviously is the story of a country which, especially on the political side, and this is where it gets nuanced with how the EU t- actually turned out, because obviously it starts as the European coal and steel community. So that's an economic arrangement during the 1990s, becomes a political arrangement. And obviously there were economic aspects of Brexit, but clearly there was a very 
nationalism, populism, what's the nature of Great Britain within a broader federal structure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the cliches. Well, I guess what, what would your takeaways from Great Britain's experience be since 2015 in this context? Well, I'd say what's happening in Great Britain actually is, you know, proves the rule here or sort of proves the point in that we see the UK economy struggling. We see, you know, official data showing that it is going to shrink uh, what it could have been if it had been tied to the EU. And we see this in the day to day. You see, you know, food makers in, in the UK, you can't sell into the EU the way they used to because now they have to pay tariffs. Now they have to go through extra regulatory, you know, sanitary checks and the sorts of things. Um, you see disruptions to business. Um, you even see, you know, many companies that used to be located in the UK moving and locating their headquarters or lots of their operations to the EU because there they have access to this huge market of, you know, 450 million people and, and all kinds of dynamism that they no longer have that preferred access from the UK. And, you know, my favorite one here is Lloyd's of London is no longer headquartered in London because it didn't make financial sense for them to stay in what is now a pretty small market in a small country. I'm wondering if it was possible to have a system or a post-Brexit period where maybe the political aspects of the European Union um, weren't as essential, but at the same time, you still kept the economic benefits. I think this is going to lead us into North America because you're going to obviously have the debates over how much is this political sovereignty versus how much is this like economic codependency. Is there a world where you could separate the political entanglements with the economic ones or are they inextricably tied together? There's definitely a world. And, you know, let me take you to Asia. So Asia is a world where there's no, you know, sovereignty issue there. There's no supranational institutions that are governing this. In fact, Asia's economic integration did not even happen through free trade agreements. It happened through companies. Uh, often they got an assist from their governments who would provide, you know, overseas development assistance to build, say, a port that would connect to the home country or build a railroad or other kinds of things that would help the industry that was going in. But, but you know, Asia's integration story started really with Japan. In Japan, after World War II, they quickly ran out of labor. They didn't have enough people in the island of Japan to build all the stuff that they had demand for. Uh, and so they started going to, at the time, incredibly poor South Korea, Taiwan, outsourcing to these countries, putting factories to, to make parts um, for their overall industry. Um, then as you see Taiwan and South Korea become more wealthy, become more sophisticated, they started doing the same thing. So they went to you know Vietnam, they went to China, they went to Thailand and other places doing the same thing. And so you saw CEOs making this decision, you know, businesses going out, mm -hmm. they would get some benefit for public money to help build some infrastructure. But it wasn't free trade agreements even. It wasn't a tip. It was not from the diplomats. It was really from the economic side and the and the private company side. Uh, and it's only in the 1990s they start to put in place free trade agreements to sort of recognize what was already happening on the ground and, and this integration. Um, so I think there's a different model there uh, that, you know, you could follow if you don't want to create these big supranational institutions, if, you know, the UK is is hesitant about those things. Um, now, the challenge is once it's already created, it's hard to say, let's go back and do something different. Um, but, you know, the UK is trying to apply to join the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a very long name for a free trade agreement that involves a lot of countries around Asia and on the Pacific, uh, on, along the Pacific, both on the Western Hemisphere and in, in Asia. Um, so perhaps they're looking for that kind of agreement. So let's go to Asia. And the Asian context is interesting beyond just the obvious points you've made here in the sense that Asia is a massive region. And I actually noticed in the book, you separate India from Asia. Um, so we'd love you to just articulate what Asia is, why it makes sense to, maybe like this is me reading too much into the words in the book, obviously, but why it makes sense to separate like East Asia from South Asia. Where does the Middle East play into this? How should we think about the region? Sure. Asia is defined in so many different ways, yeah. and it can include, you know, five countries, 10 countries, 25 countries. It's, it's you know, massive land. And so, I mean, here I looked at where the economic dynamism is. I looked at, as you look at these last 40 years, you know, economists talk about factory Asia that went from producing somewhere between, you know, 10, 15 percent of overall, you know, global products to today almost 50 percent. So I'm looking at some of those nations that are that are part of that process. And until recently, India was not a big part of that. They're not integrated, nor is Pakistan, 
Afghanistan, some of, you know, South Asia as, as often it's referred to. Um, and I don't include as much, you know, the sort of Eurasia, which is which is tied right. more towards, you know, Russia and 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 geared a bit more towards towards Europe as as such is a little bit more isolated in that sense. The the story that I found and sort of the economic history that I found here was really the story of companies going out and and outsourcing uh, and and you know building up expertise and, and technology and then repeating that over and over again, followed by governments often in in some sort of facilitating way. Um, and what's interesting here is I see this replayed. First, it was Japan, then it was South Korea and Taiwan. You know, today it's China actually who's going out and seeding foreign direct investment in other countries around the region. It's building infrastructure through the Belt and Road Initiative. Much of that to to connect commerce, to connect sort of to provide companies their companies business, um, but also to hopefully connect so their companies can go out and and be part of Asia. And you see free trade agreements following. But I do think there's there's sort of this lead by the private sector, which is really different than we've seen in either Europe or I would say North America. So that's an Asia specific story. And and what's interesting here, I'll just say, is some of this was happening at countries that had just recently been at war with each other. And, you know, there's there's conflicts in Asia where, you know, people don't agree on boundaries and lines, mm-hmm. as, as we all know. And they've managed to get this integration. And just to give you a, a number here. In Europe, about two thirds of trade and money flow within Europe. So they make things together and they sell to each other. They buy from each other. In Asia, if you look back in 1980, about 30 percent of trade was within Asia. So there's a the beginning of the supply chains, and then they would sell out to the world, often to the United States and other places. Today, 60 percent of Asia's trade is intra-regional, so within Asia. So increasingly, they're making things together, but they're also buying from each other. And as you look forward this next decade. I think we'll see more and more of that, even strengthening of these regional ties and this regional trade. I'm curious, to what degree is a regional identity necessary for these relationships? So we're talking about the, you know, Europe, most European countries are in the European unions. So there is some idea of a European, I think, especially when you get into different parts of East Asia, the raw idea of like being Asian, quote unquote, is going to be stretched beyond use. So is this purely just like a market? Are people thinking about the identity issues? Like, how should we think about how regions organize themselves that way? I think what these two examples show is that there's very different ways to get there. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can get there from a cultural point of view, a political point of view, but you can also get there through a pure commercial point of view. And, you know, uh, dare I say, not being of either origin, I would highly doubt that a you know someone from Japan would think of themselves as South Korean or vice versa. <laughs> um, and and you could name many other countries there. So it's not about an Asian identity, but it is about the commercial ties back and forth between these. So I think there's very different ways to get there, and that matters for you know the United States and North America, but it matters for the rest of the world. You don't have to be you know best friends. You don't have the same culture as your neighbor or others in your region to to take advantage of this and to help your country and your economy create you know the economies of scale the specialization get the benefits that you get from differences in types of of labor and different kinds of wages and access to finance and all the kinds of things that make what has allowed asia and europe and and somewhat north america to thrive which is to make you know high quality goods that are affordable that then can be sold to the 8 billion consumers out there So here's a question then. So to your point, much of this book is debunking the kind of globalization, world flattening, inevitability argument. The point is it's not only not inevitable, but it didn't actually happen. To what degree then is regionalization inevitable? Because a theme of this episode has been we've gotten there through different respects. So to your point, the European Union, that's a very top down Um, especially from the 1990s onwards, kind of politics first approach. But then in the Asian context, it's not top down. It's not based on like a shared culture or identity. It's just market forces, those different bits. So how should we think of the inevitability argument when it comes to regionalization? So I don't think it's inevitable because you have lots of examples around the world, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, South Asia, that didn't do it um, and don't seem to be doing it. what I do think is not doing it is does your country and your companies a commercial disadvantage? So it it makes it much harder for you to get ahead. It makes it much harder for you to get technology, to become more sophisticated in your economy, 
to provide better jobs, to grow faster in a more inclusive way. So regionalization has allowed some countries to get ahead. Uh, and those who chose not to do it, I think it's been a hindrance. Um, and, you know, lots of countries around the world, you're trying to climb from, you know, low income to middle income or middle income up into, you know, advanced economy and wealthy economies. And I do think this is a path and a pretty um, well-trodden path to get you up that scale. It's a way for you to grow. And and the reason I would say is this, um, and this is something uh, that I have thought a lot about, is that all trade is not created equal. So let me just take the United States. You know, we often, there's lots of suspicion to trade here in the United States. You know, we we feel that opening up and globalization has taken jobs and hollowed out communities. And indeed, there are communities and 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 particular industries and companies that have failed. But I do think different kinds of trade matter in different ways. And so if a factory opens up in Mexico ne- nearby, they are far more likely to buy from suppliers in the United States. And if they do, they're much more likely to make you know high quality, affordable goods that they can sell to U.S. consumers, Mexican consumers, and potentially to consumers all over the world. If that factory opens up in China, they are not going to buy much at all from U.S. suppliers. They're going to buy from suppliers in South Korea and Taiwan and, and Vietnam and, and, and Thailand and other places, and they will get the benefit of it. And they'll still make high quality, you know, f- affordable goods. But U.S. companies and U.S. suppliers won't be at all part of that chain. They'll probably just buy those goods because it'll be cheaper than the ones that those that the U.S. can create by itself. So trade with Mexico and Canada and I think others nearby actually can help create U.S.-based jobs and protect U.S.-based jobs because they buy from each other. And, and one statistic just to bring this home is the average good that's imported from Mexico to the United States 40% of that good was made in the United States. That value added was made in the United States. And so it was supply chains there. You know, there are pieces or parts and components made in the U.S., put together in Mexico, and then brought back. The average good that's imported from China has less than 5% of it was made in the United States. So basically nothing. Um, so I think as we think about U.S. policy or any country thinks about their trade policy, trade can be good, but certain kinds of trade will be better for you than others. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm recalling from the book, you gave the example, I believe, of the Ford Edge, where this is it the seats. Um, rather than just try to remember this articulation, can you like explain this, given like the anecdotal like example, like the Ford Edge, like a part of it's built in the United States, that it's shipped out. Like, what's a way to think about that? You see, you have all of these pieces and parts that move across borders. So yes, you have parts of the seat that are made here in the United States, and then they go down to Mexico, and the front fender comes together and is made down there. And then there's parts in the rails for the seats are actually made in Canada and then brought down. So you have all these pieces and parts that are moving back and forth between the three countries until you get to the final assembly, much of which often happens in the United States because it's where the largest consumer market is. Sometimes it happens in Mexico. Uh, so this dance of of the components that come together, it means that all three countries often benefit. And it means that your car is probably a few thousand dollars cheaper than it would be if it was all made here, which means consumers will go out and buy them more often. You know, you replace your car maybe six months sooner if it isn't quite as expensive as it would have been. Uh, so that means the overall market grows. But the other thing I would add here, too, which is interesting, is the United States actually doesn't have all that many free trade agreements around the world. We have preferred access where we have you know, tariff-free access or we have trade agreements with less than 10% of the globe's GDP. Mexico and Canada are NAFTA partners. Now it's called USMCA, but our, our North America partners, they have free trade agreements with roughly 60% of the globe's GDP. So if an export is leaving Mexico, so if that Ford Edge comes together, but suppliers from the United States sell and it's put together in Mexico, they can export that car to Europe without any tariffs. If we do it from the U.S., it's going to have a 10% tariff, which means nobody will buy it in Europe. So there's ways that we can work with our neighbors uh, where they can have orders, they can reach consumers around the world in competitive ways that we can't right now with our rules, our current rules. And so our suppliers benefit from working with Mexico and Canada because now they have access in ways that they wouldn't to all of those people out in the rest of the world, the other 7.5 billion people on the face of the earth. So we've been talking about North America. Let's pivot there and focus in on the U.S. specifically. So the conventional way this 40-year history is told, especially when focusing on, like, let's say on Akron, Ohio, where um, you really introduced the book with an anecdote about what existed after World War II and then what kind of went away in the 1980s. 
the traditional way we tell this story is those communities and the the states and the federal government that obviously govern those communities failed to adjust to globalization. If your story, though, then is that we experienced regionalization, not this pure flattening globalization, how does changing these terms around transform how we should think about this story? If it wasn't that Akron had to now compete with every single country and every single community, uh, if then it was still regional, does that change this at all or is the story kind of the same? So I'd say the story, and I grew up in Akron, Ohio, so that's why I start the book there, is there's sort of been, let me tell you a tale of two cities in the U.S. And, you know, Akron, Ohio is one. The other is Columbus, Indiana. So Akron, Ohio was the rubber capital of the world and, you know, had created almost half of the tires at one point uh, being produced all around the world. But by the 70s and 80s, they fell on hard times. They were competing against Japanese-made tires uh, th that came in. They were competing against French uh, with Michelin and, and Continental from Germany. But what the French, the Germans, the Japanese had, they already had regional supply chains. So it wasn't just Japanese-made tires. It was tires being made across Asia and able to service Japanese companies who were making cars all around Asia. And the same thing was happening in Europe. The European community had been formed at that time, which was the precursor to the European Union. And so they, too, had these economies of scale of all these countries being brought together. And Akron, Ohio, this was a decade before NAFTA was was thought of and, and signed. And so they didn't have partners. They weren't able to lower their costs or compete as effectively or follow their clients the way these other companies from other nationalities could. And so you saw the last tire uh, be made in Akron, Ohio in, in 1982, and the companies were then then sold off. A different story happens in Columbus, Indiana, which is not all that far away, you know, less than a day's drive away. This is the home of Cummins Engines, so a big engine, you know, cars and vehicles and trucks and machinery. Um, they started, uh, the company started between the two world wars. They boomed in after World War II, supplying lots of engines all over the world. They too, same period, 1970s, 80s, hit really hard times and looked like they were going to go under. They were facing... Japanese engines that, because they were produced across Asia, were more efficient uh, and also less expensive. They faced challenges from, you know, BMW and, and Mercedes and others in, in Europe that also the same thing. They managed to eke it out through the 1980s, and I would argue they were saved by NAFTA. So NAFTA comes along, begins in 1994, and so Cummins is able to diversify its costs. It put some production and assembly in Mexico as well as keeping it here, so it lowers overall costs, so it can compete with for you know Ford and GM and others for the engine contracts. They also get access to Mexico's market, which they never had had before. And in fact, Cummins becomes the number one brand for truck engines in Mexico. And I've lived in Mexico. There's a lot of trucks down there. <laughs> uh, and so they actually build and expand a big uh, plant in New York State to service Mexico in terms of their engines. And they become, again, a global brand because they're able to lower costs, but also create these you know very high quality, uh, very robust engines. And so in that sense, they regionalized and it helped save their company. The tire companies were a little bit too soon and on their own. And, and I think that's part of the reason um, that they were really unable to to keep going. And Akron has become you know, a, a town that still struggles to recover. So that's interesting. So when you say they were on their own, you mean there wasn't a broader structure like NAFTA that enabled them to compete? Is that the way to think about it? Yeah, they didn't at that point really have the ability to move part of production to Mexico or other countries where they could take advantage of different costs. Um, they did not have access without tariffs to other markets as such. Uh, while, you know, Japan and, and the European uh, tire makers did have access, they had access to the whole European community. So you just weren't able to get the economies of scale or specialization or or sort of markets where you could experiment with innovation and the like. It was a bit more difficult for them, and they never quite got off of their back foot after being pushed back in the 1970s and 80s. And by the time NAFTA came along, by the time you had expanded markets and access and the like, those companies had already been sold off and, and were no longer American companies. So I want to get to Mexico and Canada in a second, but I'd love to hear just your articulation of how we should understand NATO, especially because since the U.S. You know, MCA in 2018, we've just dropped um, that side of the conversation um, for a variety of both, I think, good faith and bad faith reasons. So how should we understand NATO from 1994 onwards in terms of like what it did, what the costs were, what the benefits were, and 
where you see as the gap between what could have been in terms of those communities like Akron and then what we actually got. So NAFTA, we're going to talk about NAFTA, right? Yes, yes. Um, So we saw in the 1990s, NAFTA gets signed in 1993, comes into force in 1994. And over that next six, seven years, you see a big increase in intra-regional trade. So trade between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. There's there's a huge bump that gone, it goes from about 40% of trade between the three neighbors to 47, 48% of all trade is between the three of them. You see a lot of money come in, foreign direct investment in, in all three countries, but particularly moving into Mexico, which had been very close to its northern neighbors and in, in terms of its markets and the like. And you see an increase and a boost in manufacturing jobs in all three countries during this period. So it really, it was sort of the honeymoon days here, but you saw what one expects from free trade agreements, really a boost to all three economies. What happens is in 2001, we see China join the WTO and NAFTA provided some, you know, even ground and sort of rules for all three of the countries, but China joining the WTO, you see China begin to undermine many of the benefits of NAFTA. So you see lots of imports coming in from China to all three countries. Uh, And, you know, we talk a lot in the United States about Chinese imports undermining various towns and and industries. And, you know, there's a famous paper by some U.S. economists that it's called the China shock. (laughs) And so how it affected our economy. Um, But I think we often forget in the United States is actually Mexico was hit much harder than the U.S. and U.S. communities in terms of this hollowing out of of manufacturing or of some industries, because Mexico was a direct competitor. So what had once been vibrant, you know, toy industries or footwear or apparel, so much of that or electronics, you know, kind of small electronics, so much of that left Mexico and, and headed to to Asia. And they've just been been trying to recover as well during this time, just like the United States. And And I think the challenge for the three countries is, as we hear in the United States, often Mexico is to blame for a lot of the jobs that left. Uh, I think I would argue, and you look at the economic data, um, they didn't steal jobs. And in fact, they probably protected a lot of jobs here. And I think there's an argument to be made that if we had not had NAFTA, the North America, particularly the U.S. car industry, wouldn't be what it is today, where it employs over a billion people and, and makes the vast majority of the cars that are sold within North America. So I think we misinterpret what NAFTA did. And I think what NAFTA did is at the beginning, really bring in jobs and and bring growth and the like. Uh, Once China came in, it protected some jobs, um, but we didn't see that deeper integration that happened in Europe um, because we didn't have institutions or or sharing of money and the types of things for, for economic development. And we didn't see the integration across as many industries as you do in Asia. So yes, CEOs and companies in particular industries, the automotive industry, aerospace, maybe some processed food, they did take advantage and create regional supply chains, but lots of other industries didn't. And so many companies then, because they didn't have that benefit nearby of economies of scale and and such, they moved to Asia. And so they recreated those supply chains, regional supply chains in Asia, rather than creating them in North America. And so I think the challenge today is how do you bring some of those back and create them here in the Western Hemisphere? What about Canada? Like, where does Canada fit into this story? Canada is an important partner in this. It's a smaller partner in terms of, of population, um, but it has a few big strengths. It has a, a strong automotive industry, so it has a lot of technical skills and the like there. And, and more and more manufacturing is a higher tech industry than it used to be. And so I think there's quite important skills and and innovations and and people and and engineers and the like from Canada. The other thing Canada has that the U.S. And, and, and Mexico have, which is a real advantage of North America, particularly today as we look forward to the next decade, is a bounty of energy. There's a bounty of traditional energy. There's a bounty of potential renewable energy. And as I look at these big regions around the world, one of the huge benefits or advantages North America has is that you have stable, affordable energy. And you know we can't say that anymore about Europe, given what's happened with Russia, Ukraine. And you can't really say that about Asia, which really imports so much of its energy and it's quite expensive in its production. So I think Canada provides both natural resources, um, energy is part of it. They also have lots of green uh, minerals, minerals that go into the green transition, you know, the kinds of things that you need for electric vehicle batteries and other kinds of, of you know, renewables. Um, and they also have a, a population um, and an educated population population. 
um, that is vital for sort of the next phase of, of all kinds of production, but particularly manufacturing and services. So for this last section, I'd love to hear just your thoughts on just kind of what's been left to the side here, which obviously is, you know, Latin America, Africa, India, Russia on a couple of different levels. What are the prospects for these regions, but also just individual countries that are in the case of India and Russia so large and impactful that they could qualify as being relevant in that category as well, too? So right now, this 40 years of creation of global supply chains and, and this regionalization that's been happening, I do think it is a once in a generation time when you're seeing fluidity in supply chains. So they sort of settled in and are pretty sticky uh, in terms of, you know, companies set up their operations and they find their suppliers and, and trusted networks. And then it's hard to move them because it's costly in terms of time and energy and, and potential downside if you get if you get it wrong. But we're seeing a real fluidity today, and there's a lot of reasons. Uh, and this happened before COVID, but I think COVID has just accelerated um, the need for boards of directors and CEOs and others to think about moving around. So automation is a big part. We're seeing more and more automation in more and more industries and, and, and types of, of sectors. And so that makes low-cost wages and, and labor less important, or at least relatively less important than logistics uh, and the like. Um, so that's one thing. We are seeing demographic shifts. And so places that used to be low-cost labor are no longer so low-cost labor, China being one of them, but also other countries that are aging, whether in Europe or across Asia in many places. We are seeing the effects of climate change, um, both actual climate change, so natural disasters or rising seas that make logistics harder because ports are underwater. And so there's costs to distance because of that. You're also seeing the costs of climate change policies uh, so many countries either have put in place or are thinking about putting in place taxes if something comes from far away because every you know, every extra mile is a carbon emission. And so there's cost to distance. So you're starting to see changes there. And then the big one, I would say, is the geopolitics. And this last year has been heavy on geopolitics. We've seen the U.S. and China begin to decouple in particular high tech industries. But but overall, you're starting to see movement out of China for those who supply the U.S. or or vice versa on both sides, and then we've seen the Russia-Ukraine war, which is a, you know a, a very hard break in in geopolitics, but affecting this movement. So all of this together, you have companies thinking about where do I want to put my footprint? How can I make sure that my my goods can get to market and can they can get to market faster? Because consumers want everything tomorrow; they don't want to wait, you know, uh, eight weeks or twelve weeks for something to come across a boat in the Pacific before they get their new TV or bed or or fast fashion clothing and the like. So all of this, I think there's a huge opportunity for the Latin Americas, the Africas, the other nations that were left out last time because you're seeing this movement. Lots of boards of directors are making decisions and if they're gonna move, there's more in play. To gain advantage or to become part of this though, there's lots that these countries have to do. They have to make themselves attractive. So they have to create logistics, make sure their logistics aren't very costly because companies look at that, it's you know hits their bottom line. They need education systems that train 21st century workers. So, you know, manufacturing is becoming more automation is being put in place. You have to have, you know, more technical abilities uh, in order to operate machines or be part of these processes. Um, and then I think the other part here, again, regionalization matters. Because if you look at countries like, you know, Peru or Chile, or you look at countries like South Africa or or any of these countries across Africa, they're just not big enough on their own to support a car industry, to support an electronics industry. You need to combine together both the market size, the labor pool, the access to capital, the knowledge uh, in order. And that's what Asia has done and why they've been so successful is combining these countries. And, and that's what a lot of these places need to do as well. So I think that is the challenge, but there's also a huge opportunity today and in the next five to 10 years. So then the last few wrap-up questions, number one, Given that five to 10 year timeline you're discussing here, is this something you're optimistic about or is this something that one should be kind of trepidatious around? Given the trends we okay. described here. So change always brings some trepidation. But I would say I'm somewhat optimistic on two levels. One is that, you know, as we started, there were dozens of countries that were left out the last time around. And now is an opportunity for at least some of them to join in. So I'm optimistic that 
this isn't the end of supply chains or the end of production, or it's not going to lead to sky high inflation because there's other people who can join in here. They may not be China, not a China that was the China of the 1990s, but there's a lot of places here. And I think overall that could be good for, for hundreds of millions, perhaps a few billion people who haven't had opportunities or as many opportunities in the past. So I'm optimistic on that side. And then the other side where I, I'm optimistic or I think realistic is that what we have found through the geopolitics, through a global pandemic, through all of these stresses on the global economy, is that international supply chains are incredibly effective. Uh, and yes, we can talk about the disruptions and you know everybody wants to know if you're going to get your presents by the holiday and the like because things are snarled up in ports and the like. But I think we also forget that in the face of a you know, once in a century supply shock as, you know, the system shut down with COVID, you know, airports closed and 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 boats stopped flowing and people went back to their house and factories shut down. Uh, a once in a century demand shock where people started buying totally different things from For all sure. over the world. And, and, you know, maybe a once in a century logistics shock where nothing was moving around. You know, after four, six weeks, everything was back on the shelves, that this international supply chain actually got things back where they needed. And even things like, you know, protective masks that we wore to protect against COVID. We saw in, you know, in May 2022, China built or or fabricated, you know, made, you know, more masks in that one month than had been supplied by the whole world the year before. And so the scale of supply chains, their ability to move up and down and, and the benefits from international supply chains for price and quality, I think that was proven to really work. So I don't think we're going to see supply chains end. I think that's going to be part of our future. Um, what we may see is them move to different places. And there, you know, there's pessimism and that some places will lose out that were big beneficiaries the last time because of geopolitics, because of other factors. But other places that were that did not participate or participate very much have an opportunity uh, to perhaps grow and, and benefit. And what would you say, let's close with this, would be your set of prescriptions, an agenda for, let's say, the United States where... To your point, regionalization already existed. That didn't come about in 2021 magically. But there is this once in a century almost opportunity where the supply chains are shifting. What would be your piece of advice that would fit in the spirit of what folks should have thought in the 1980s? So my advice for the United States is that we need to move away from thinking about buy American to buy North American. We need to think less about protecting our own market and finding a way to make things with neighbors or with other countries that we can make products that are affordable for all the consumers out there in the world. And we need to think less about having a bigger piece of the U.S. pie or the U.S. market, consumer market, and think about gaining a piece of that global pie. And the way we do that is by sharing the wealth or sharing the jobs across a regional supply chain. That is how we're going to be able to compete with goods that are made in other places. And what has happened over the last 40 years is that the making of products and manufacturing has become a team sport. It's lots of countries that are playing here. And you can no longer play singles. You can't be played by yourself if you want to compete more broadly. And that is how you're going to bring jobs home to the United States or create more jobs here. So, so overall, it's a change in mindset that trade is not a bad thing, but trade with those nearby where you can create regional supply chains uh, is better than others. And we should embrace that. And then with that, uh, you know, think about how do you strengthen those economies and make them more attractive for investments all around. So whether that's infrastructure that connects those economies, which is important, whether that's training and education that provides for U.S. workforces, but also workforces that U.S. Uh, companies are going to be tied to in Mexico and Canada, and perhaps other countries in the Western Hemisphere. Um, whether it is free trade agreements that open up markets that right now we pay tariffs on, um, that you know we would be able to have competitive products go in. There's a lot of things we can do. But overall, what I would recommend, uh, which we're still struggling with, I think, is yeah. that building things across borders, having part of production in other countries can strengthen our own economy rather than it's not a loss. It can actually be a gain if we look at it the right way. Well said. Um, 
Shannon, thank you so much for coming on the realignment. This has been a topic I've been just obsessed with this year. This is why this is one of the closing episodes of the year. Um, are there any suggestions you'd have for viewers or listeners to delve deeper into this topic going into 2023? You know, there have been a lot of great books that are out there, and this is a, you know, vibrant debate that's happening. Um, so I would, you know, take a look at at many of the ideas that are are circulating here in terms of globalization uh, and the like. You know, we see books. Um, uh, there's a one called, uh, I'm, spacing, I'm spacing on the name right now, but there's one by um, Gary Getzler that's about sort of the neoliberal period and, and, and you know, how it, it's rise and then it's decline. Um, there are you know other people who are talking a lot about uh, industrial policy and where this fits in. We didn't get to that, but I think this is a big part is is governments are going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to try to influence their economies. And that, too, is going to matter significantly as we go forward. Um, but I guess overall, I would advise people start thinking about this. If you start looking, um, there's lots of ideas out there um, and, and look a little bit deeper than the, you know, than the overall globalization, deglobalization headlines. Well said. Thank you so much for joining me on The Realignment. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. 